Shalom and welcome to all of our audience uh, from all over the world. My name is Yehuda Michael. I'm a program director at MCTC. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My colleague Nuria Levy and I are very excited to have you with us uh, for the second meeting of the lecture series titled Advancing Leadership Skills to Women. And the overall objective of the series is to empower women to develop uh, essential strategies and mindset needed to maximize leadership potential and successfully achieving professional goals. Uh, on the series, we invite one Israeli and the Meshav Lamanai to speak, uh, followed by the question uh, and answer from you, the audience. Uh, the series holds a three meeting. For the first meeting last month, we focused on uh, developing a personal brand and discussed a personal branding strategy and the challenge women face in leadership. For the second meeting today, we will focus on strategic thinking method. And for our final meeting in March, we will focus on decision-making skills. We hope you're gonna join us for the final meeting in March too. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about MCTC, uh, it's founded in 1961 by two visionary women, uh, former Prime Minister uh, Golda Meir and Mina Pensvi, MCTC founding director through Meshav, Israel Agency for International Development Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, MCTC uh, focuses on three areas. Uh, the first one is entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, the subject that Israel is well known. Uh, as many of you heard that Israel is named as a startup nation. Uh, we share our experience on this, this topic. The second focus is early childhood education that mainly focus on building the next generation. And the third subject is uh, sustainable community development, which focus on social economic topics related to the society. We believe in women's contribution to society and the country's economy. Uh, we stress gender equality is the key for sustainable development. So um, this is about us. Uh, we're recording this meeting and later we're gonna post it in our YouTube channel for those who did not make it uh, to be with us live. So if you do not want to be recorded, please turn off your camera. Uh, without further ado, I wanna introduce you with the first speaker for today, uh, Juna Matahima, uh, Mashab Lamanai from Nepal. Uh, Juna Matahima is an entrepreneur and a researcher who firmly believes in contributing to the community in both professional and personal capacity. In 2002, she co-founded uh, Bliss Media Private Limited as an advertisement uh, and research agency. In 2007, she co-founded Siwa Security, a stock brokerage. She is also the co-founder of Consult One, a company uh, providing a management consulting service uh, established in 2016. She's currently the co-chair of the Women Entrepreneur Development Committee of the Federation of Nepal Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Thank you, June, for joining us. Uh, please take it from here. Thank you so much. Uh, namaste and shalom, everyone. And very good afternoon here. And good, good morning, good evening to uh, to people from all over the world. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Nuria, Yehuda, and Mashaf for giving me this opportunity. Yes, I'm from Nepal, the land of um, the highest mountain in the world, uh, but this is not the Mount Everest, however. Uh, and uh, my country is a landlocked country. It's covered by India, surrounded by India from three sides, and one side is, uh, is China. Uh, I was in Israel, Haifa, in 2018 for three weeks program on entrepreneurship. And now, yes, I'm here to share about leadership strategies and uh, also about how to do that, how to make that in a, in a, in an, as an action plan. We all have heard, uh, should I begin by, uh, begin Yoda? Okay. Yes, so, uh, yes, we all have heard that, you know, we all are leaders and this, in fact, is true. Sometimes we, we just plunge into leadership roles, like even without realizing, and sometimes it is a deliberate role that we are given uh, to perform. And uh, 
the point is to think about what kind of leader that you want to be. Do you want to be a community leader? Do you want to be a business leader? Or do you want to be a political leader or a sports leader? You know, you can be a leader in any kind of uh, in any kind of sector that you are in, and your strategy as a leader will be defined by the kind of leader that you want to be. I started my company 19 years ago, and uh, I have also been in leadership you, position in in different organizations. Yeah. Uh, through these years, I have developed different kinds of leadership uh, skills, and sometimes it just happened organically. Uh, today, I would like to share uh, share those skills and strategies that has worked with me, and, and I hope. And I'm hopeful that uh, it, it uh, is able to touch you and connect you in, a, in some way. So here, uh, I'd like to share my screen. Let me know, Yoda, if you're seeing it again. Last time it was... Yes, I'll take... Now it's fine, right? It's fine, yeah. All right. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to have uh, Mirav also here with me, who will be speaking after I do. And um, right. So the first one that I'm, I'm sharing here is to understand your environment. Um, like my parents, my parents were economists and they were government employees. And I belong to a nuclear family, um, two, two siblings, both sisters. So we were raised as individuals. And you know, I did not see the difference between bringing up of a girl and a boy, you know, the changes, different kind of upbringing that they have because we were all girls and we were raised individually. Uh, to add on to that, I studied in a, in a, in a girls' school till my 12th grade. And you know, uh, till that time, I was just seeing all women all around. Uh, and it, it actually made me you know, confined in a way that I was oblivious of the rules, the norms, the stereotypes that goes around men, women, and all genders. And uh, not just that, I rarely ventured into, into uh, you know, to know about what is happening around the world. So un up until seven years ago, so that was up uh, till I was 35, like that. Um, I was very content doing, you know, going to the office, doing my work, coming back home, meeting friends to unwind, and then, you know, going uh, or, you know, just uh, gather, uh, go around for a gathering. But you know, I was very content and happy when I was doing that. And nothing was, else was, I was not venturing into anything else. But one fine day what happened was I got this opportunity to go for a five weeks program. It was a fully funded program to US and it was for all entrepreneurs and we, I was already working. And the program was a, a bubble burst to me in many ways. Like the first one was I, when I went there, I knew very little about the entrepreneurial ecosystem or enterprise in Nepal as a whole. Another big shock was uh, the participants that were with me, I didn't know them at all. Like we even didn't have one mutual friend in our Facebook, you know, it was, it was like that. So a very, I, I, could re I realized that I was really alien to the people who are working with me in Nepal you know, like the way I was working together with them. So, um, so, so I was like, you know, what do I do now? Because I was, I didn't know anyone like that. You know, I was just working by myself and just being happy in that. And so when I came back from that trip, I joined a membership based organization for entrepreneurs uh, called Nepalese Young Entrepreneurs Forum. And uh, this forum not only helped me, um, you know, understand the business community all over Nepal, but it also exposed me to the policymakers, journalists, and other organizations that supports entrepreneurs. And uh, here I would like to say, like, you know, as women, um, we tend to work in isolation and very happy in that. We are not sad, you know, we're very happy, but we are happy to work in isolation. But then what it, what it does, like, it makes our perspective very narrow. And to be a good leader, uh, uh, to be a good leader, we need to participate in our environment and get involved actually you know not just participate get involved like understand the big picture 
uh, see who are the other leaders, you know, the other stakeholders, the big and the small players, what are the driving factors and the gaps that can be fulfilled. But as a leader, we need to have a holistic view. And when you understand your environment, you actually can leverage your strength and be a better leader. So I think the, uh, my, my take on understand your environment is whatever environment, like whatever work that you are doing, uh, you need to understand the, the, the environment of that work surrounding the work and also the other environments that you can get involved in. The next point that I would like to share is the power of being in a network. The, the membership-based organization that I talked about, um, when I joined, it was in 2015, when I joined, there were just very few women in that network and around 80 plus male um, uh, entrepreneurs in that in that network. And you know, I I had attended several meetings where I was the only woman, and I would be invited to um, a big uh, you know high level meeting to every local meeting, and it was getting really very lonely because you know I was just the one who was going everywhere. So I needed to develop a strategy to bring in. Uh, bring in more women in the network because the network was 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 giving me so much like it was giving me a lot of exposure and i i felt that you know it is not just for me to hold and everybody should know about this and as a leader i think getting in a network is all about getting being informed know what is happening around get all the uh, requirement required information and be aware definitely be aware so I gave myself three months to bring in 30 women entrepreneurs in the network. I, I developed a strategy to have you know, a reduced fee and uh, had programs which was focused more on women. And yes, I'm happy to share that I got around 25 um, at the end of three months. Uh, these women who have joined uh, are now participating in different programs, are networking uh, for their business growth and, and getting opportunity to interact with government official because they have access to this. Otherwise, if they were not in the network, they wouldn't have access to these uh, these things. So, being in a network, uh, being in a network is also is is also important because it makes you connected with the environment that you are in, and uh, which goes back to the first point that I said, like to understand the environment. So, my my suggestion is you have to look out for associations, groups which aligns with your leadership goals. You know. Uh, just be aware about these networks because these networks are the super platform for you to explore leadership qualities and also pull in your bank of resources because you're going to meet people you're going to uh, interact explore more so you know these kind of network you have you should be on the lookout of association with alliance with the with your goal and uh, together with that uh, being in a network we are able to know about the different opportunities and resources and uh, as a leader, you need to share your resources and be a generous connector. So I think this is all about what I wanted to say on, you know, being a power, uh, the power of being in a network. Now I'm going to talk about the roles and achievement, which I have felt very strongly. Uh, in my society, we follow a uh, follow patriarchal, uh, patriarchal system where there is, I, I'm just talking in general about a life cycle of women like, uh, a girl uh, is, stays, lives with uh, her parents until she gets married, gets married, goes and lives with her husband uh, and, and his family. And um, then she has kids, she raises kids, and basically she's confined inside of home. Now things have started to change. She started to go to school, go to work, and also take leadership positions. Uh, so she has moved from inside of the house to outside of the house. However, uh, though her role has now changed, the role inside the house has remained the same. You know, so she does both. She does the inside house also and outside house also. She she is doing both the roles. Um, I'd like to uh, point out that we still have a habit as a woman. We have a habit of staying in, in our comfort zone, you know, talking less about what we do outside of home. Um, and so that so as not to sound too much of, you know, like bragging and uh, somehow not talking about what you are doing outside of your home has uh, it has, you know, we have failed to show 
our, our world, the changing faces of women leadership. The organizers of different panel discussions, workshop, conferences come to me time and again saying that, see, we're not finding women speakers in issues like environment, journalism, legal issues, um, industries, tourism, health. You know, the list is endless. It's not that there are not many women, uh, you know, there are not many there. It's not that there are women who are not in these uh, areas. There are plenty. It is just that these women are not talking what they are doing professionally. So the image remains the same, you know, it's the kind of work that they are doing, the kind of impact that they are making, it is not visible. It is not visible and they are doing it, but it is not visible and the, and the people are not seeing it. So the leadership role that the woman has, you know, it actually is changing, it's not visible and the changing face is not, it's, uh, you know, the result is it's not visible, the, the role also. So. It's actually, you know, the very few women talk about what they do professionally, and we need to show and be vocal about um, how we are changing the face. Women need to see other women uh, who are leaders in their community. We need to have role models from our home country to look up to. You know, we always look up to women who are from a different countries, and especially like, you know, I've seen a lot of women, women who are in our international um, you know, uh, internationally famous as role models, but we need leaders, women leaders from the home country to be visible. So, uh, no, don't be shy. Do not be shy about talking about your achievements and don't underestimate yourself. While preparing about this uh, presentation uh, of today, my sister told me about this imposter syndrome that we all have, you know, that um, that we, we our victim of imposter syndrome, uh, where we doubt ourselves despite our achievements. But the thing is, your experience is as unique and as and is valuable as you are. And we need to recognize this and value our capabilities and think that we are worthy of, of better things. So just be visible and talk, talk about impacts that you have made in your community, in your country, in your office, wherever that is, you know. So it's very important to talk about our role and achievements. Um, one thing that I have uh, been very strongly felt is this one also, to reach out to your resources. Um, I have a research agency, and uh, when I started this company, uh, the only knowledge that I had about research was one semester of MBA, research methodology, you know, that's it. And the time when, we had, when I had started, I. I didn't say no to any work that came my way. But then to do that work, uh, I reached out uh, to, to, to all kind of resource that I could find, which included people in my network who had previous experience. So for me, my journey is a, is a learning journey and it is a non-exhaustive learning journey because I am learning every day uh, from you know from a lot of different kind of people. So one is reaching out to your resources is with could be within your net network. Another one is another powerful resource is mentors. As much as it is important for the leaders to be mentoring other people, it is important for the leaders also to have mentors. These mentors can be anyone in your network who you know can help you see perspectives. They can be from any field, any background, and may not be an expert, but you know, they will be able to help you, guide you when you hit a wall. And brainstorming with them can give you ideas and give you a new outlook in a different way. It's always, it's always uh, uh, enriching to have a mentor who can give you perspective of things and you know, not, just, uh, not just give you expert advice, but actually know you when they are giving their advices. Along with the mentors, uh, leaders need support from expert advisors as well as well uh, as well as because you know this because they give you the sector specific knowledge that you need. Like you know, uh, as a leader, you cannot be an expert in everything. You cannot know everything. You can be expert in few things, but then you will need these kind of support to help you in in different kind of scenarios. So. These are the, uh, the resources that you know re you can reach out to, and uh, my suggestion is, as a leader, you should not be reluctant to approach people for help, and you know look out for people who can assist you on different different issues, 
and don't be afraid of healthy discussions, you know, to have healthy discussions. Um, then, yes, take care of yourself and your team. Uh, so much is talked about um, bringing in a balance of work and life. And I know achieving this balance is very, is very stressful and uh, it's, it's a guilt task. It's, you know, you, you're full of guilt when you're doing that because there is always an imbalance. You, and so what I do is um, I have stopped thinking about balancing it as such and I prioritize things to be done and sometimes work takes much of my time and uh, sometimes life comes on the forefront. So it's prioritizing your uh, things that, that you can do. But in both the cases, uh, I remember to take care of myself and be happy in whatever situation I am in. So remember to take care of yourself, you know. So you have to remember to take care of yourself uh, in, in any kind of case. And of course, uh, to do this, you do this family support is a critical factor. So it is okay to allow your family to help you. So, you know, you, you, the family support is very important uh, when you are taking care of yourself, of your loved ones. And um, I should mention that you have a scheduled break, time break, and mark that in your calendar. Spend time with nature. That doesn't mean that you have to go for a hike or, you know, plan for a long trip like that. Even a, even a little sunshine or a cool breeze can, you know, can do wonders. So uh, they need to take care. So as a leader, you have to be kind to yourself. So I constantly remind myself to be kind to yourself. We push ourselves so much that we forget to be kind. We, be kind. we will be kind to everyone else but to ourselves. So we have to remember to be kind to ourselves. Uh, leaders also take care of their team and help the team members to bring out their best. Uh, you know, bring out their best to help them build their capacity, help them upskill, reskill, and know their aspirations. Basically, know their aspirations, and they, you don't uh, know their aspirations and help them grow. In fact, you know, uh, so take care of your team as well when you are taking care of yourself. So being a good leader is also also about quietly gaining the trust and confidence of people who are work and working together. It is about recognizing people's strength and listening to them for better results. So this is, you know, I have uh, abided by these. Now pay it forward, my favorite. So I'm an entrepreneur like uh, Yehuda when he uh, mentioned me, I'm an entrepreneur and a researcher and I firmly believe in giving back to the community. The sense of giving back to, to the community came to me when I ha went to this program, you know, that I talked about, you know, uh, it was a fully funded program. So initially I felt like, you know, I had taken a loan, you know, uh, a loan from a bank and because, you know, somebody else was paying for all this, all this trip to, for me to be in a program. So I need to give back and pay that loan and be hypothetically loan free. You know, so so I so then I uh, I just uh, started to volunteer and give my time and energy to promote entrepreneurship and leadership in Nepal. <clears throat> Excuse me. I organized workshop um, conferences, discussion forums on women entrepreneurship. Uh, became mentor in different kind of sixteen week, fourteen weeks, twelve weeks like that. Entrepreneur, sorry, mentorship programs. Uh, conducted sessions on uh, forums on women entrepreneurs and uh, gave uh, you know consultation on research to grow business and I became advisors you know in in many different organizations uh, to work on entrepreneurship so paying it forward can be in any form any sector any magnitude it may not be just in terms of financial contribution it can be you know it can be like for example if you are in a sector and uh, uh, let's say if you are in uh, in a league, if you are a legal consultant, then you can pay it forward by by creating a platform where you are giving legal advice, uh, free of cost, to poor and needy, whoever whoever that may be in your society, and just uh, whatever expertise that you have, you can just give back in that, and uh, the possibility is actually limitless. You can have paying it forward in many different forms. And when you do that, believe me, you will receive much more than you've given. 
and uh, it is a very very rewarding rewarding experience and um, this paying it forward is actually i participated in another program and from there i got this word paid forward it is from uh, another program uh, by vital voices so there i had learned this paid forward so as a woman leader we need to be mindful about making space for new women leaders also there is no option women need to promote women and women need to put other women in leadership position and move away so that they can lead right and um, i hope i i continue uh, growing as a leader so that i can i can fill that gap and inspire and uh, enable the next generation of women leaders um i think um, i'm done with my presentation these are the points that i talked about and um, thank you viewers for your time and patience i hope uh, i've been able to connect with you and uh, the strategies and the action plans that i shared uh, are useful to you and yes thank you so much thank you juna that was really great i'll thank stop you. sharing thank you juna Thank you, Juna. This was a, a great presentation that we heard from you. Um, you. We really appreciate it. So we we're gonna move into our second uh, presenter. No, yeah, we're gonna take it from you. Thank you, Juna. It's been absolutely a pleasure to hear your thoughts on leadership and to hear again about your experience here with us. And Haifa, it was really wonderful that you were able to join us and. Uh, hopefully soon we'll be able to visit you as well in the beautiful Nepal. So now I want to introduce uh, Miraf Oren. It really is uh, my privilege to introduce her. Uh, we have worked with Miraf before in the past and I'm really pleased that she can join us today. So Miraf, um, she's a serial and multidisciplinary entrepreneur. She has started several startups uh, currently in in culinary and food, such as open restaurants, whether she combines art, design, innovation, and tech. And she's also the co-founder of Act Food Tech, an innovation hub, Food Dish, which is also a social media app. And she was also the founder of WMN, which is Women-Led Ventures, a co-work space and ecosystem for women led startups and female entrepreneurs. This was in, in the city of Tel Aviv. And it's a place where you're opening the doors to women uh, and to give them tools that they need to expand their own uh, ventures. She's also the founder and CEO of Urban Playground, working with cities and nonprofit organizations and public and private partnership initiatives. So once more, Mira, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your your experience with us and with our participants worldwide. I'll leave the microphone to you. Okay, thank you. So first of all, thank you for having me. Thank you, you, Danuria and Michelle. Um, I'll share my screen for one second and I'll take it from there. Um, do you see my screen? Yes, yes, we are. Okay. Okay, so thank you for having me. Um, I'm speaking from Tel Aviv now, and it's very exciting to see there's people really from all over the world here, which is uh, really fascinating. Um, I'm 52 years old, three kids, and I call myself a passionaire. Passionaire means passionate entrepreneur, because I think that in order to be an entrepreneur, we need to, it, it's in your DNA usually, it's something I think you were born with, but there are two things that I think a person has to have in order to be an entrepreneur that's passion and curiosity and when I wake up in the morning I want to be like this I want to think what I want to do I want to love and be passionate about whatever it is that I'm doing and usually I would be very also curious about stuff this is how ideas come up to my mind um, I'll say something that usually I say later on, but um, I even believe that um, sometimes I'm a bit too passionate about things. You know, my, um, what do you call it? The screen, the screensaver of my telephone, it says, hold your horses. Because sometimes I, I can just walk in the streets, think about something and just, you know, want to make something out of it the day before, uh, after. So um, that's why. 
Okay, so my first business, I always say, started when I was eight years old. Um, it was a garage sale, like I think a lot of kids do. Either they sell lemonade or they do a garage sale. I lived in the United States with my parents. We were for two years there for a, um, a remote, whatever you call that, relocation. Um, and I did a garage sale and my parents said that I didn't want to go home before I uh, had one dollar in my pocket. So it, I, it's like I always remembered it as like my first um, experience. But uh, if I fast forward a bit before uh, before I was 26 uh, in the university, if I'm uh, um, in the university, I, I went to the university. I studied economics and uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, business uh, business management. But the truth is, I never really studied. I used to uh, sit down in the cafeteria and I used to organize uh, um, parties and most of my uh, and I don't have a degree until today. Uh, most of my time in the university used to do parties and stuff like that. Um, I took all of my friends that uh, studied with me and I made them work with me in companies, uh, sales promotion agency and so on. Anyway, when I was 26 years old, I founded BTL. BTL was a company for uh, sales promotion and special events. And how did it start? I used to work in another company that did sales promotion. It was very successful. And then I said to myself, OK, maybe I can do something like that as well. I went and worked for someone that his company was the biggest company in Israel for festivals. He used to do all the beer festivals and the food festivals and so on. And I told him, uh, okay, let's start working with your clients. You already work with the biggest clients, with the biggest bank in Israel, the biggest uh, beer company, the biggest food company and so on. And let's give them, uh, let's stretch your band and give them um, services from the uh, sales promotion and special experiences uh, world. So we started working. I worked for him for three months and it was so successful that I kind of felt like the money was on the floor. And we're talking about 25 years ago, yeah. Um, and all I need to do was just to collect the money. There was so many clients and so much work to do. And the company was very successful. And after three months, I thought to myself, okay, so if I came with the idea and I came with the expertise, then I would go to that guy and tell him that I want to be a partner, not just work for him and start his company. So I decided I will go and offer him to be my to be his partner, not to be my partner. Um, and when I was thinking to myself, what would I ask him as a woman, 26 years old, we're talking about a long, long time ago, hardly any women in my field as CEOs, I thought to myself, okay, so I'll ask for 15%. Maybe he'll let me have 15% of the new company. Uh, a day before I did that, I went to talk to my husband and to another friend, guy that he, a, a guy that had a, his own uh, company. And I told them what I thought. And they said, why 15%? I mean, if you have the expertise, you came up with the idea, you do most of the work, you want to found a company with him, tell him you want to be 50% of the company. Take it or leave it. Okay, I was quite shocked, went home, thought about it, came the other day, told the, told the guy, listen, I want to be your partner. I think there's a lot of potential. This company can be very successful. Uh, let's found the company together. Um, and I want to be 50%, <laughs> take it or leave it. So he went home, he thought about it, came back after three days, and he took it. So when I was 26 years old, we founded together BTL. BTL was a very, very, very successful company just to understand how successful, if we're talking in, uh, in local um, coin, which is shekels, the first year our revenues were 1 million shekel, the year after it was 3 million shekel, the year after it was 7 million shekel. We just double ourselves every year. Two years later, I bought his part. That partner that I wasn't sure that he will give me 50% of the company, I bought his part. Um, now, the funny thing that was, I was around 28, he was 38, he was, 10 years older than I was. I thought he was really a very grown up and I'm just, you know, this young girl. Um, and all of our clients, most of them, no, all of them, I think, were men. All the CEOs of all the big companies that we gave services to were men. And they all thought that I was a secretary. So we kept on saying a year after I bought the company, we kept on saying that we are partners. And it was my idea. I wanted to say it because they thought I was his secretary. So for me, it was good that they still thought that he was my partner. For him, it was nice because, you know, they still thought that it, it, it was his company. But today, 20 something years later, 
I guess I wouldn't do it. But then I thought it was a great idea. So anyway, I bought his partner. Two years later, I sold the company to Mekan. Mekan Ericsson is the, the largest uh, advertising agency in the world. On the way between um, buying the first partner's part and selling to Mekan, I merged the company with another partner, had to buy him out, stayed with the company and sell, sell to Mekan. Um, those were very, very successful years, very hard work. But what happened then was something that can happen only to women. Um, I, I, it's called a silent birth. I don't know if you know what it is. It means that I, I got pregnant and I gave birth to a child that, to an infant that um, didn't make it. We needed to, um, it, it, it didn't live. Um, and it changed my whole life. I stopped my life for a year. I left the company. I went to be at home. Well, as a matter of fact, I did that. I'm sorry. I, a year after my first child was born, I have three kids and they're amazing. Um, after the first child was born, I just understood what happened to me before. And then I went home, sat at home for a year, left the company um, and thought, what do I want to do next? And in the next couple of years, I did a lot of projects, a lot of new initiatives. And if I fast forward to 2015, in 2012, again, happened to me something that can happen only to women, and I had breast cancer. And I'm fine. Everything's fine. You see my hair. I grew up and all. Um, and in that year, I, again, stopped my life for a year and said, okay, how do I go on from here? And what is, what is it that I want to do that's going to still make me really wake up in the morning with that passion that I told you about and want to, like, eat the world and succeed, but like I think what Juna said, also to pay it forward, not to do only things for money, because until that day, I had made a lot of money. I was very successful, but something here was missing. Um, and in that year, in uh, I call it the cancer year, I had a lot of time. I couldn't work. Um, I used to go to a place called Sosa. It was the first co-work space in Israel, in Tel Aviv, uh, before we work, before anything was here. And a friend of mine who was the owner told me, listen, you have time, just come here, come every day, just think what you want to do. So I came, I started working from Sosa and I looked around me, it was 2.15 already, no, 2.13. And I didn't see any woman around me. A lot of, it was a place for startups, for VCs, for everybody. About 95% of the people over there were men. And I said to myself, okay, I know what I want to do. I want to have a place just exactly like WMN. But the only difference would be that in each one of the startups that will be working from our co-work space, the, the must-have thing I want is that we'll have at least one woman as a founder or CEO. It doesn't have to be a woman's only place. I don't want it to be a woman's only place. But I want us to have at least one woman in the leading role or the founder or the CEO. In order to have that, I, I had to found my own place. That was WMN. I want to show you a short video. I hope it's going to work um, about WMN. And let me know if you hear it and if you see it or not. This place is very unique. Uh, I've been working from San Francisco for a while from different accelerators for founding and selling two successful startups, one to eBay and another to Get Images in the past. Uh, but I've never seen such a place like we have here in Israel. And it does an amazing job in helping women to start their first business by themselves. The ecosystem in Israel for startups is really amazing. There's a lot of support, there's a lot of resources, uh, and people are really accessible. I think that uh, because the support for startups here is so strong, that moving to Israel and starting a new company, for me, we're, we're very tied together. WMN is a co-work space and ecosystem for women entrepreneurs. I just wanted to have more women-led ventures in the industry. And the basic way I think to do it is have first to have a physical space because every startup needs a place to work from. And then you have to have, of course, a network and ecosystem. This is what we're doing here. We have here uh, 20 startups that are women-led ventures. 
One of those 20 startups is mine. I'm a founder of a startup called Coolies Market. We understood that it has to be an innovative platform that is a one-stop shop that can help people easily order tickets to culinary experiences around the globe. MissBiz is an on-demand mobile platform for beauty services. So we work with a community of businesses and we help them to become successful and financially independent. We are a personalized GPS app for walking in a city. It gives you a route based on your interests and needs. And the idea is that in a big city like New York, London, Paris, there can be many ways of getting from point A to point B and sometimes going even a little bit uh, out of your way or a different route, you can have a completely different experience. Startups is uh, actually, that's what I'm doing most of my life. When something disturbs you or you, like, you think about an idea, the fact that you can act and execute on that idea and it suddenly gets successful, it's just amazing. Sorry, if I go down. Okay, so before I go on to open restaurants, I want to tell you something about WMN. Uh, did you hear and, and was the sound okay? Everything was okay, yeah. Okay, so the last woman that was talking on the video, her name is Maya Gura. Maya Gura is a serial entrepreneur. She's already sold, she sold, okay, before I tell you who she was. Um, when I just found a WMN, I did a post on the Facebook telling uh, everyone I'm looking for startups that want to work uh, from the new co-work space. And I'm looking for mentors and uh, people to help the startups. And Maya called me. She said, hi, Merav, my name is Maya Gura. I'd like to be a mentor in the new co-work space. Now, I said to myself, never heard of her. I knew there was a guy that his name is Eyal Gura that just sold his company, uh, his startup to eBay very successful company here in Israel. And when she called me and I was on the phone and she said, my name is Maya Gua, I want to be a mentor. I said to myself, I wonder why she wants to be a mentor. I mean, okay, so she's the wife of Eyal Gua or Ron Gua, I don't remember his name. Um, and he sold his company. Does that make her someone that can be a mentor? And I told her, yeah, but how can you be a mentor? I mean, what do you know about startups? And she said, I just sold my company to eBay. <laughs> And I said, I don't get it. Didn't Ron and Eyal Gura send their, so, so sell their company? So she said, uh, yeah, Eyal is my husband. Ron is his uh, brother. I founded the company, um, but I asked them to join me. So I said, so I don't get it. Why doesn't anybody know about you? Why don't we know Maya Gura founded the company and sold the company? And she said, ah, because when there was the pictures for the newspaper and everything, I didn't want to be in the front. So I told her, listen, Maya, we don't know each other. Not yet, now we're friends, but uh, it was a few years ago. We don't know each other, but um, this is the first and last time in your life <laughs> that you do something like that, that you sell your company to eBay and you think it's not really important to be in the front because me, as someone that really helps women um, and my, you know how we have our, our set of mind unfortunately, something we have in our mind that, you know, when she called me, I said to myself, okay, probably the guy sold the company, right? There's no way this woman might know this. And, and, and this is talking about me. So people think of people that don't know female founders. What do they think? You have to put yourself in the front. You have to have people to know that it was your company. You're the one to, to do it, of course, with them, but you cannot be absent from the, from the picture. Okay. No way. So today she's sold her next company already and she's very much in the front and we all learned from it. It was a great lesson. So I just wanted to tell you about it. Okay. Open restaurants um, is another project that was, I say it was born in that, um, what, what I call the cancer year, um, sitting in that uh, place in that co-work space in uh, after I free chemo treatment, I used to go with my husband to a restaurant and, you know, just to feel a bit normality. And I was wondering what's going on in the kitchen. So I wanted to take a sneak peek and understand because I'm a producer in my heart. And, you know, when you sit in a restaurant, the, the plate is very nice and picturesque. It's like an art and it's very quiet. And I knew that in the kitchen, there's like a war now. Everybody's shouting, it's very hot over there and so on. I wanted to peek into the my favorite restaurants. 
So what I did, Open Restaurants, was a project that we did with all the, we started in Tel Aviv. What you see here is the picture of the mayor of Tel Aviv and the best chefs in Tel Aviv. And we did um, uh, culinary workshops inside the restaurants with the chefs. So you could meet the chef, learn his secrets, to understand what it is to be an owner of a restaurant. The festival has grown very, very big. It started in Tel Aviv, then we went to Jerusalem. Last year, of course, before the COVID, until 2019, it became an urban culinary festival, combining food with everything from art to design, innovation, tech. It's 120 events in five days. And it's, I, I have another video, but I don't think I have time uh, to show you, but uh, it's, it's really fun. So we'll go on. Um, before I go to my next part of the presentation is to talk a bit about uh, innovation. I wanna say three things about being an entrepreneur that I think it's not tips, but it's something I very much believe in. One, um, if you wanna start your own new business or your new initiative or your own startup, whatever it will be, I start, I need to visualize things. I start from having a presentation I put everything like you saw my presentation now. It's very easy to have people understand what I'm thinking about when I have a presentation. Now the presentation should have big picture, one or two sentences, not more than that. I will talk you through the presentation, but for me, it helps to think that I have a presentation. And the most par important part, I think in the presentation is an advisory board. When I'm talking about an advisory board, I'm saying if I'm doing open restaurants, so I went to some famous people uh, that I thought that they're, the fact they will be as my board in the presentation will help me sell my project. Now, why would they be in my presentation? They need to believe in you, right? So it's usually you start from, in Israel, it's very easy. We're very connected to one another and, and people, as uh, Juna said before, pay it forward and help one another. So I really, really, really recommend that if you start a new project, have someone help you get to the people you want to be in your advisory board and put their name and title on the advisory board. Tell them you want them to lend you their name and title. And it will be very helpful for you because when I see the presentation and I know that they are backing you, I will probably believe in you. The other thing is go and get advice from other people, but go get advice from people, not the ones that, it's easy for you and that you know what they're going to say and that you're going to say that it's very successful going to be and you'll be great. No, go get really people that really understand it, that you're willing to get from them. Maybe the fact that this business is not going to work or that it's going to work, but it's going to be hard and listen to them. At the end, you will need to decide what you're doing and listen to your stomach, but go get advice. I think it's very important. And the third and very important thing, Juno said it also in a, in a different word, is surround yourself with yes people. What do I mean yes people? People that say yes before they say no. Don't, I, I not negative people, but positive people that um, if, if it's your employees or your partners or whoever, I don't like people that explain to me why it wouldn't work. I like people that it will say, okay, let's try. I'm not saying that everybody, everything is gonna work and we need to be reasonable. But before we decide that it's not gonna work, let's give it a chance. Let's find out if we did everything to make this try try to make this work so these are my three kind of tips now if we're talking about innovation i have also a few things i want to say one again juna said it in a different way is never be embarrassed if you're embarrassed no one will see you but if you're not embarrassed okay maybe it wouldn't work maybe people will laugh at you but maybe it will work as i said before let's try the the um, positive option collaborate. We really need team players. We need to team work with other people. And in individual genius is a myth. Innovation is team play. When you have other people working with you, it will always be easier. Take continuous feedback. I think it's like I said, go and get advice. No crit, not criticism, not judgment, not decision, only feedback. Have people give you feedback all the time on what you're doing. The feedback could be good, could be bad, but it's feedback. And it's not criticism, as I said. You know, when you do um, um, brainstorming, it's very important not to be criticism. But listen to other people. Embrace diversity. I think there's nothing to say about that, how important it is, but in people, in places, in reading, in watching, in doing, in thinking, in feeling, diversity around all the time, so, so, so much important, not only women, men, everything. 
no escaping hard work. You know, in all those realities on TV, it seems like everything uh, happens in a minute. Well, it doesn't. A lot of hard work. And there's no, um, in Hebrew, there's a phrase that it says, uh, no way, how do you say it in English? No shortcuts. You need to do the journey, the whole journey. No escape hard work, but it will be worth it at the end. Someone, could you mute yourself, whoever it is? I don't know who it is. Thank you. Um, no ego. Be humble. Um, it's the idea that's being judged and not you. If you go with your ego, it will not take you anywhere. You need to put your ego aside. This is the project. This is what I want to do. Is it good? Is it not good? If it's not good, it doesn't mean that I'm not good. It means that the idea is not good and we can change it. But you got to put your ego aside because the ego is something that um, is important, but it can be an obstacle. No commitment, no innovation. You have to be committed. You have to see your um, goal and go there. And you have to be very committed to it. You have to work in it. You don't work at it, no innovation. Um, as I said at the beginning, no passion, no innovation. Work, I, again, not that it's easy. Wake up in the morning with your eyes in, in the stars. Um, and that's it. And thank you. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, thank so, you so much, much uh, Miraf. It's uh, been absolutely a pleasure to listen to every <laughs> word that you had to say. And I think all our audience have been very quiet uh, <laughs> listening to what you had to say. Really very inspirational to hear uh, all about your story. And of course, this center, which is all about empowering women and advancing women. Uh, what you really do and what you, your career so far, it really stands very much behind as a true testament of, of what we stand for. So thank you so much uh, again for all your, for your presentations, a pleasure. And I'm going to pass it back to my colleague, Yuda. I think we'll have a few questions for you two girls. So there you go, Yuda. Let's see who we have. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Nuria. I also want to add up what what an inspiring story that both of you are told here. Uh, a lot, a lot to learn from your life experience, and I really want to thank both of you. Uh, my first question uh, would be for Juna, uh, and the question is, um, how do you measure a, a strategy's effectiveness? Uh, you're muted, Juna. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you, Yoda. So the question is, how do you measure your uh, a, a strategy? How how it's effective? How do you measure that? Okay. So uh, for the strategy, I think like how I see it is. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. The strategy is how I see it is like you always have a goal to achieve for those strategies. So looking at your goals, if you've made your strategies, and while doing that itself, you will know whether it has worked or not. And uh, for, for measuring that, the one thing that I know is the reactions that I get. I think Mirav uh, also talked about getting feedbacks, right? So sometimes for the strategies to know that uh, has it worked or not, you need to have feedback from the people who, who were directly connected to the way that you're doing, you know, the strategies for them, for whom you've made it. So the feedback from them is one of the measures that uh, can be done. I think another one is actually, you know, how it has worked or not also depends upon how, how it, was it a long-term goal that you've set or a short-term goal that you've set? So it depends upon that also. Um, does this uh, answer your question? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, I'll ask another question to Mirav now. Uh, my question to Mirav will be, uh, how do you set up a, a long-term goal for your team? And how often do you check and review those goals? Mirav? Okay, um, usually the way we work is we, well, uh, not only a goal, but I'm at the strategy of the company. So I will look five years in advance where do I want to be? And then you cut it backwards. So you say, okay, um, 
if I want to be, let's say, um, I want to build this building. Okay, I don't build the buildings, but um, and I want it to be built in five years. So let's go backwards and see how do we make, how do we achieve this goal in the first year? What's the second year? What we need to do, and so on. Um, that's on the big strategy. On the day-to-day -day stuff, it really depends what you're working on because some of the projects we have a weekly. Uh, team meeting, some of them we can have only uh, a day meeting or, you know, it really, really depends. In startups, things run very fast, so. Thank you. Thank you, Mirab. Um, another question to Juna, uh, which is kind of similar, I think. Um, how much time per week or a month or something do you invest in the strategic thinking with, uh, with your employees? Yeah, can you say that again, Yuta? I said, how much time per week or month, uh, in a certain period of time, do you spend in strategic planning, uh, planning of the things you do in your organization? To tell you honestly, sometimes none, you know? <laughs> so it depends upon the project that I have and uh, depends upon the time availability. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you just have to you know, uh, when, okay, if I have a project, sometimes the client asks me, like, can you do this in a week's time, you know, a 10 days time? And uh, that those are the times when I think um, I'm most effective because, you know, I need to finish it quickly. And likewise, we divide the, so the first thing that I do whenever there is a strategic uh, planning to be done is I set a timeline and the activities that I need to complete within that timeline. And who are the responsible people? You know, what are the, even mark the holidays in between so that, you know, nobody is deprived of those stuffs. So uh, I think uh, I, I work very much inside a framework. Like I need to write things down and have it planned accordingly as per the timeline. So, um, and I write it and make the people who are involved also be involved during the strategic planning. So that way, the ownership goes to them as well. And for you know, I I will not be like I will I will not be like I'll be directing, but I work as a team player, and so everyone is involved. And um, sometimes, like I said, there is no strategy, nothing. We just sponge into whatever we have to do, and we just do it. That's a great answer. That's great. Thank you. Uh, my final question would be for Mirab, uh, and the question is. Uh, can you describe a time when you failed to achieve your goal and had to follow a different approach? What exactly happened in such kind of situation, Mila? Ah, uh, of course, I want you to understand all of you. <laughs> I failed my goals a lot of times and I did not always succeed, not in my startups or my initiatives and not in my businesses. And I think that you have to fail in order to succeed. So we all fail all, um, along the way. But again, it depends, did I fail with a company or did I fail with a small project? And uh, I think the, the most important thing is to be very flexible, not to get in love with your ideas and your projects and to understand that you can, uh, as I said, listen to other people, learn from it. And the fact again, that you failed with a project did not mean, does not mean that you are a failure. Although I must say it sometimes is very hard to, to understand that because when we fail in something we feel very bad okay and um i failed in my in my journey a lot of times and i took it very hard as well but um i understood that i cannot okay it's it's okay to understand that this is not working but it doesn't mean that i cannot make another project again and make it successful we have to believe in ourselves we have to listen to our as I said, to our stomach, to understand, of course, we have to do, sit with your team and understand what was not working. Why did it not, not work? Maybe the, uh, the clients were um, not, the, the, you were addressing not the right target market. Maybe your product was not good. Maybe no one needs it. Maybe it was too good and you were not prepared as well as, as, as uh, the way you were supposed to be prepared for uh, so many people. So the, the reasons could be so much, but I think what, what you need to take from this is just that it happens. You need to learn from it and see how you look to your next project after you learn from what happened to, to your, uh, from this failure. 
Great, thank you. I think that's a great uh, suggestion not to give up, they're trying to learn from it. Thank you. So I think we have more questions from the audience uh, that Nuria is following. Please, Nuria. Just, just a thanks, Luda. Yes, a few things. Um, first of all, Biraf, I, I'm coming back to what you just said was exactly the question because a lot of our growth comes precisely from coming out of our comfort zone. And, and that would be the, the question, how would you encourage more women to try this, to come out of the comfort zone? Do you, who do you, did you ask me or Juna? Yes, Mira, first you. Uh, okay. Um, I think it's all about education. Um, and I must say that uh, I personally think it needs to start very, um, what do you call it, very early in your life. But uh, uh, Juna was talking before about the fact that we need uh, local um, role models. I think role models is one of the most important thing in order to have more women or men, it doesn't matter each one and whatever we're talking about. Uh, to be successful, you need to have role models. Now, I must say that in the tech area, Unfortunately, there are hardly any um, role models that are uh, what we called unicorns, a million billion dollar companies. And most of the, here in Israel at least, okay, most of the billionaires are still men, but still there are amazing role models here. And even if they're not billionaires, um, I, I know what I tell my daughter, okay, my, my 15 year old daughter, I think she sees her role model at home and it's very important. She sees that anything she wants to do, she can do. I mean, my three kids, not only my daughter, my three children, from the minute they were born, they have a, a, a father and mother that can do whatever they want. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman in our home, okay? I know it's not like that everywhere, but I think that's the way we need to try and live. And that's the way we need to show our kids. And if we'll be role models and we'll, we will be surrounded by role models, that would be very helpful. Thank you, Miraf. Thank you so much for that. I couldn't agree more. And as, as mothers, we always tell our children all these things and we encourage them for sure. Uh, Juna, uh, we have a question for you. How do you manage an employer who will always come up with a no first on a new project that you've initiated? Yeah, so I think um, I, I, try to, I try to believe that I am a yes person. I try to stay positive all the time. And uh, a person who comes with a no uh, will definitely be like, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a just opposite, right? So I think I'll try, I usually try to understand why that no is coming from and not be very judgmental about it, but try to understand because, you know, if I'm always, if this per I'm saying yes, and if this person is saying no, then this is a, it's a different perspective that I probably should know, you know, why this person is coming with a no with an answer. And uh, if, if that person has, and I, I'll be happy if I can convert that no to yes, but, <laughs> but then uh, I will definitely try to understand why that no is coming and maybe if i can talk around and uh, if actually the if the project is actually a no no you know i'm just saying yes uh, for a different thing so uh, i think understanding and then contemplating on the things that that person has to say i think that's the best i would like to do thank you so much Juna. Uh, i think we're actually kind of running out of time so i'll just say uh, one last question for both of you uh, next month, we're actually celebrating International Women's Day. And uh, what I wanted to ask you is, is uh, what's in your opinion, what's causing the, 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 the lack of diversity and, and women actually reaching uh, the top positions? That's something, what is your opinion on the matter? That's something I wanted to ask both of you. You can Sorry, I didn't hear the, the second half of the question. You said there is a Women's Day and then I didn't hear you. No, my question was, uh, was in your opinion, was causing the lack of diversity in top leadership? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, why enough, why no, uh, no enough women are actually uh, rising to the top? I'll do it very quickly. I'll say it, it has to do with what I said about role models, about, uh, um, what do you call it, education? about uh, the fact that 
the world is still being ruled by men mostly. Um, all those reasons together. And I must say that I really don't like Women's Day because of the fact that I don't think we should need a Women's Day. But of course, unfortunately, we, we need it. So we're doing everything we need. But um, I really hope that one day we will not need a Women's Day. That's my uh, final thing about that. Juna, to you. Yeah, I agree with you completely. Actually, yes, this, this, this particular question, Nuria, I also ask myself, because here too is the situation is the same. And, you know, I sometimes feel very sad that, okay, I'm, my mom was talking about the same thing. My probably grandmothers were talking about the same thing, you know, having more women in leadership position. And I am also talking the same thing, you know, it's three generation past and, you know, how many generation needs to go uh, far ahead to not talk about men or women, you know, like, you know, like that like there is a competition as because, uh, like I said, the whatever I had discussed in a in the leadership, uh, you know, in, a, in my presentation, it is actually doesn't define well, entrepreneur doesn't see a man or a woman. It's entrepreneurship, right? So is a man or a woman or other genders also, you know, so we are still um, uh, it's it's really sad that we're still fighting for this uh, this role, but as Mirav has said, until that happens, that we don't have to fight about it anymore, we will have to promote women. Need will need to promote women and have more people come in leadership positions, and probably we might need to groom them, which Mirav is already doing uh, with her projects, uh, with her with her work, and uh, you know we groom and have many role models come in, have new uh, women leadership in different places, in places where there are no women leadership, make it a point to, you know, uh, at least push that, uh, that line and have them have women leaders, you know, leaders in their committee or, or, you know, in their association or their organization, whatever. So, you know, until the time when we don't have to talk about men and women and having equality, um, I just hope that that day comes, you know, soon in my lifetime, probably. But uh, until that happens, yes, we will have to have uh, people like you, people like Mirav, and everyone to support women. Thank you so much to both of you. I couldn't agree more. Thank anyway, you. it's a. Uh, we, we, we could continue asking more and more questions, but uh, we, we know you're very busy women and we can't thank you enough for spending this time with us and with our audience. Most of them are past participants from our courses and we really enjoy seeing all your comments. I don't know if you had a chance to look at the chat, but there is so many people out there grateful for your words and your experience. And uh, we wish you both all the very, very best and hope that we can meet up again soon. Especially you, Mirab, they're close to us and we still haven't been able to come to even Tel Aviv from Haifa. So uh, thank you so much. And to our audience, uh, thanks again. And we'll, we will see you in the next session, Yehuda. Yeah, thank you. I will join Nuria by thanking everyone, including our speakers. It was really uh, pleasant to hear all the uh, stories that, that we heard and to learn from it. Uh, next um, month, we will have uh, a, an, another meeting that will focus or more in the decision-making uh, strategies. So please, please join us. Uh, we will send you an email a reminder uh, when the date is closer. Uh, and we will really thank you. And we have a great week. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day for both uh, the morning, so afternoon. Thank you, Juno, Mirab. Hope to see you in Haifa 